Well, welcome everyone. Uh, we are the Remote Leader Project and we provide on-demand online courses and group coaching to be able to help you learn the skills needed for virtual leadership because being able to lead dispersed teams requires some nuances and extra mindset and skill set to make it successful. And uh, who am I? My name is Allison St. John. We also have a for our fellow co-founder, Christina Rowe, with us here today too. Hi, everyone. And uh, be sure to find us on LinkedIn and stay connected with us as we are continually to monitoring remote leadership as it unfolds in our world today. And we are all here today to be able to learn something new, but what I hope you come to expect is micro learning. Uh, we know that you are busy. We know that you have teams to lead and businesses to run. And so we do all of our education from a micro learning perspective. And what that means is we make sure that the content is bite-sized and that you have the ability to not only learn and absorb information, but also have the time to reflect and apply it directly with the end result of actually having behavior change. And that's what we're helping to look for because as remote leaders, we hope that you have the ability to evolve your leadership sense and the behaviors that you're doing. So we were going to give you some content today on our topic, which is all about expectations and boundaries that guide outstanding remote work. And as we approach on more of our examples that we have for you, we're going to do large group discussion to allow each of you to self-reflect, apply this knowledge, and then of course be able to share with each other because we have individuals coming from across the country, actually around the world that is registered for this in various industries, everything from oil and gas to retail and fashion, um, to small business software, to um, marketing and so much more and what that ultimately means is no matter where you work and the important business that you were doing you still are a remote leader and you are navigating the remote space and so we are dedicated to being able to provide you with the skills that you need to lead those dispersed teams um, so let's go ahead and get started with the chat if everyone could find it there I've got two questions for you since we're talking about expectations and boundaries what happens when expectations and boundaries are missing? What have you experienced perhaps in the past couple of weeks when these boundaries have not been upheld? Um, or what boundaries in particular for you are you finding is the hardest to hold? That's great. We're seeing a lot come in around conflict arises, right? That we're seeing different pieces of misalignment or pieces where, um, we're seeing that it's really hard to also let go of some of that control in this current environment, letting the team drive itself because so many things are changing. You want to make sure that people are seeing the same changes that you've been seeing. And a lot of that brings up a lot of emotions for us. A lot of times we'll hear it as frustration or anger or disappointment or disrespect. Um, we'll see those are all very emotional conflict words, right? And you all spoke to the examples of, we really see a lot of conflict start to evolve when we may have an expectation that somebody else has a very different expectation. And we have one that's in our head and we wanna get it out and we may make the assumption that somebody else is already on the same page. But what is actually happening is we have our perception of what is a reasonable expectation and somebody else has their own and maybe they're not actually synced up. And what we see when we move into the remote space is we actually see that it also drives us to be very reactionary instead of planned or open and discussing. And so what we'll be talking about is today is also What's the mindset we have to shift? What's the process we have to put in place with our expectations in order to take them from our own perception to that place where they go out into the world and we're kind of getting pulled in all these different directions because there's a lot of changes going on um, and we become a little more reactionary and then it becomes a big mess. It's kind of like, I don't know about any of you, but I'm not a particularly good drawer. And it's kind of like, when you can envision in your mind exactly what you want to see on the paper and you can't quite get your hand to do what your brain is thinking. 
And so you have to work on different skills and different ways of honing it or different approaches or break it down in a different way so that you're getting closer and closer to what that result is. And that's how our expectations really work. They end up being what we're setting to out to achieve. They're also helping to set the guidelines around what's the behavior that is acceptable and should be happening as a way that we're interacting. In there, we also end up giving behavioral permission when we let those expectations slide. And there really are agreed upon operating guidelines together. The way we're gonna interact and the way we're gonna drive forward as a group or even for your expectations for yourself. And some of the reasons that these expectations are so valuable is they act as our roadmap. They also are definitely creating our and defining the quality of outcome. And the more that we have a sense of what quality is expected, what that end impact, that result, what it's gonna look like, the easier it is to also give up some of the control to delegate to other team members if we're, we're able to hear that we're all on the same page of what that quality expectation is. And it's really valuable to make it a two-way discussion. Because remember, in so many things in the workplace and so many things about guiding a team and being a leader, you want people to buy in and have a part in creating those expectations and creating that roadmap of where you're going because none of us want to break down what we've spent time building. We want that to succeed. So it's easier for us to help maintain those expectations when we feel like we helped build them. And you want to set those milestones. And why does this all matter? Because it makes delegating easier and it actually sets your high achievers up for better work. Our high achievers are highly engaged by the idea of knowing where they're going and knowing what they need to accomplish. Think about it as you can't really surpass a bar if you don't know where it is. Those high achievers want to know what's expected of them so that they can meet it or surpass it. We often think that our expectations and boundaries especially are just for maybe the lower achievers on the team. And it's actually often more valuable for our high achievers, especially in the remote workspace, because they know where they're going then. Think about it the same. You first need to have an awareness of what's your own perspective of this expectation, that kind of internal setting of an expectation of where you want us to go and where we're, what we're going to achieve, how we're going to interact while we do it, and then we're going to create a conversation around it. Make it go both ways. Get that buy-in, gain it, and then set what is that final expectation. And then as you're walking through the actual action of it, hold the boundaries. Holding a boundary is extremely important when it comes to the process of getting to that final good result and having really great outcomes for your team because we all push boundaries every once in a while. Not purposefully, sometimes out of distraction or a missed deadline on accident. And so reminding ourselves and keeping those guardrails up of what our boundaries are really help us get to the bigger outcome. Indeed, this is why boundaries are so important and we can't really talk about expectations without it is because they are the best complement to our expectations and they go hand in hand. And ultimately, as Christina just said, boundaries create the guardrails that direct our needed behaviors. Um, and ultimately, hopefully, should be the boundaries that even help to maintain and hold them uh, because it is easier said than done. Am I right? Yes. We have the best intention to close our computer and to step away from the office or from our home office at the end of the day, and yet we keep coming back to it and we start overworking. So when we want to think about setting boundaries, some of the best practices to do so are to set them early and often, both with yourself and your teams so that you can create clarity around again what it is that you expect. Um, also make it easy to respect for yourself and for your team. Uh, as you are wandering, th walking through uh, leading your remote team, it's important that you don't become necessarily the disciplinarian or the one who has to reinforce boundaries all the time. Um, and, but So make sure that they can be easy to be respected, that they're easy to understand, that they're clearly connected to the expectation, and that there's an expectation that they must be upheld. 
Um, and again, this goes for you. If you have your own expectation for your own work for the day, what do you expect to get done? And then make it easy to respect that you are finished with the day, that you can walk away so that you can move on. So let's now take a closer look at this process. This is the mindset of a remote leader and their ability to understand what's currently happening, what they're bringing to the table, how to set the uh, collaborative expectation, how to set the boundaries and then move forward from there rather than being so reactive to what's occurring. And in order to look a closer look at this process, we're now going to go through four common examples um, that occur within remote work. And guess what our first one is? Overworking, because you are not alone. Overworking is probably one of the, the greatest symptoms uh, con connected to isolation or the feeling of isolation. But this is all about setting the expectations of what you can deliver. So what we're going to do with our four examples here is go ahead and explain the brief scenario. Won't take much time for overworking because I know you all know it. Then we're going to ask you a question for you to create the solution for you. Uh, we're going to do this with chat. So I want to make sure that you all are on your keyboard here and again, ready to go where um, we want to ask you what is a realis realistic expectation or a boundary. And then would like to invite all of you to one of you, I should say, to share briefly about what it is that you can up with as a solution for yourself and then we'll cover a couple of other suggestions of things that we found to work the best uh, within within this challenge that's listed here so let's begin with our first example that we have again the concept of overworking and again this is related to mindsets of most often everyone's a high achiever who's committed to the work to delivering the best possible and they have that get it done mentality and they don't know how to stop until it's done I'm one of them. I can, almost can guarantee that every one of you here is in that same boat. So we don't take breaks. We're not being able to set up those boundaries. So in chat, I want for you now to take a moment to self-reflect on your overworking behavior. What is a realistic expectation that is needed to address overworking for you? Um, Jackie Wallace, I just want to honor and recognize what you had to say because I think this is so critical. The work will still be there tomorrow. So unless it's truly deadline-driven work, I need to stop for the day. Applaud and well done. Yes, yes, yes. Um, so this is this is also the core ultimately of how we could be making decisions about our work is what truly is connected to a deadline and then therefore honoring the deadline to myself that I have the space to be a family member, to be a parent, to be a friend, and to simply be a human being that's not connected to work. Um, so well done. Uh, here are some other suggestions. A number of you have called out the concept of being able to um, block and calendar, to have that expectation of being able to schedule things. Um, to be able to have daily mental breaks of good, such great stuff. We also just wanted to um, include here estimate work, estimate your work. So sometimes you need to in a remote workspace of like, how long will this task actually take me to perform it or to complete it? And then um, setting that expectation that it will take, if I think it only take an hour, maybe it'll probably take two instead and start to learn a proper estimate, uh, estimating. And then of course, set aside some head downs time and boundaries to help set up the guardrails for overworking is exactly as some of you had said, close your laptop, walk away. Um, I have the ability to be in a home office. I literally close my laptop, I walk out of the office and I close the door, especially on the weekends has been really helpful for me so that I vis uh, visually not seeing my office in any capacity and I've closed that off. Um, you can set alarms you can limit meetings um, and, and uh, as well as figure out anything else that may work for you. So now let's start to go ahead and look at the next common challenge within remote work, deadlines. So deadlines, and we really talked about that a bit with this is a nice compliment to the overwork. Sometimes we drive ourselves to that overwork place because we don't slow down and try to set a realistic expectation for how long something is going to take. Um, we saw a few things in chat where people were um, acknowledging that it's become even harder during the COVID-19 because 
with it, we actually have those emotional distractions. Sometimes our brains are reacting a little bit differently. So things that might've taken you an hour to knock out before actually take more like two and a half hours because that focus isn't as readily available. And so this is where it becomes really important to think about how are you creating buy-in with other people? How are you driving to create deadlines that are realistic for you? Do you are you gonna have enough of that time to carve out in your calendar between now and that deadline to accomplish it? Are you going to be able to really have a realistic like buffer for the amount of time it's going to take and asking that of your peers. This becomes crucial when you're setting deadlines in the remote space because when you can't see the workload that people have, it makes it more important to make it an open conversation so that they have a chance to notify you if things are kind of overwhelming or pieces like that. So our question for you is, what are the boundaries that need to be set and honored when we're talking about deadlines. We That's great. Megan shared that you have to be okay with pushing the deadline if you don't feel like there's enough internal buy-in. And that's a great piece to be considering in your expectation setting too. Up front, is there that buy-in? And if there's not enough or if people feel hesitant, can you nudge that deadline a little bit and create a more, um, congruent consensus there. We're seeing ones like ask for support. If it feels like you're not going to be able to meet it, can you acknowledge it early and often that you need some support or offer support if, as the leader to other people if it seems like, you know, they haven't been touching this project very much. It doesn't seem like it's not really going where it is. So the, and the flexibility to kind of pivot as targets move in this timeline becomes really important. And that's a great example of the boundary is still a deadline, but then it's a group consensus to move that deadline. So it doesn't become a missed deadline because that gives us behavioral permission to miss deadlines in the future which can really create a lot of conflict on the team and create a lot of doubt in people in their peers because people often structure the way they work and the way they look at if somebody's accomplishing enough in their role by how well they've met those deadlines. So instead of making it a group decision or making it a way that you're really fostering positive behavior coming even out of COVID as well down the line that people know that it's not okay to just skip the deadlines. Moving on to distribution of work. Sometimes we run into these places, especially when we've been in the office together where we're kind of like, yeah, yeah, we all have the same idea, right? Like we're all gonna work on this project, but the assignments aren't super clear. There's some gray area, there's some who has final sign off on it, or we get into this mentality where it's, it's just easier for me to do it myself. It takes too long to delegate something. It takes too long to explain something or teach somebody a skill. Or we have this downfall of almost too much shared ownership where it's we're kind of stepping on each other's toes in it. Um, I've seen it where somebody will ask another person to do something on their way out the door one day and then they'll have it done before that person even comes back to the office the next day because they're like, oh, well, it was just really top of mind, so I just knocked it out, right? It's a little tempting for all of us who are really high achievers where we want to just check things off the list and keep moving. But what we do there is we create a lot of confusion. And so tell me, what is it that needs to be a realistic expectation when you're working with a group on a project or leading a team? What needs to be part of that expectation? I'm seeing some that are really great about um, projects may, getting comfortable with the concept and setting the expectation for yourself that when you're collaborating, you might produce a higher out level outcome, but it might take longer to get to that outcome. And you have to be okay with that resource of time being spent on it, as well as there might be a huge benefit 
of allowing somebody else to take on certain roles and not jumping in because they might look at it from a different perspective that's really valuable to the team in creating bigger outcomes or better outcomes or higher quality outcomes. And those are great points. Um, we're also seeing communicate, 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 which is great. And that is a big piece of this. This is a big piece of any interaction that you're doing and setting expectations, making sure that the vision is really tied in for where we're going, and then being able to dole that out as well as setting up who's going to be part of the review. Where are those different kind of quality markers or milestones within your project and be really clear about defining the roles between who's producing certain content and who's reviewing certain content. The boundaries to do is really hold to those review phases to help people keep feel like they have the involvement that needs to happen that and see that the project's on the right track, as well as leave some space in that plan and those realistic expectations to build skills. The boundaries are holding people to putting in the effort to actually refining a skill or taking the feedback and being able to do it better at the next review process. And Sherry, you bring up a great point. Defining the quality of your project or your task will also help with the overworking. So as you can see, everything is starting to overlap. And it's about no matter what the example is or what industry you're working for or what project you have, it's about the mindset process as the remote leader to be able to, again, understand where you're coming from and then to go through the collaborative process of making these expectations very clear and then going forward and setting action to set the boundaries. And this will apply to anything. And our last example we have is something that you all have, guys have already talked about is the concept of communication. But I wanted to hone in specifically on two particular areas here within remote work. We have the tendency to want to be helpers and of course be overachievers. So we want to say and that we are available anytime, reach out anytime. Even if perhaps I'm working on a global team and I am on a completely different time zone, but I'm available anytime. It's not accurate and it's not true. And we need to go ahead and start to set the boundaries that that's not necessarily what's going to take place. We can still be supportive but we need to set the expectation that I am not available all of the time and that I am available at clear amounts or if I am available all the time and you can message me that I may not necessarily respond right away. And this is the other trap that often occurs within remote work is quick response times that we get into this reactionary space that someone has pinged me on Slack and sent an email and now they've got my cell phone number and they're calling me or texting me and I have to respond immediately to everything. This again, we start to get reactionary. So we need to pause and as a team and as a leader, set what are the expectations for uh, the, the you know, my communication processes, what are the channels that are available to us, um, and then plan for emergencies, which I'm going to get to in one second here because I want for you now to tell me in chat what boundary needs to be set and honored for the communication within your team. I love that, Valentina talking about doing office hours for their team where they have blocks of 30 minutes to an hour every day so people can stop by and ask a question. And Allison and I are both big fans of having your Zoom meeting open so that your um, the people you manage can pop in, ask a question, maybe co-work a little bit, and that, that creates a much more um, succinct sense of being able to get the answers you need and you know what time of day you can get those answers easily. Yeah. Megan Mills, thank you for your honesty. Don't be the one breaking the boundaries. Um, as a leader, it is so important that if expectations are set and then boundaries in place, you can't be the one exactly to break them. And the more that you're trying to access everyone all the time, if you're the one who is trying to respond immediately, um, we're not role modeling what it is that we want to be actually occurring within our team. So be mindful again of what it is that you're doing. And so let's circle back to this concept of the planning for emergencies. Quick responses do need to exist for true emergencies. Um, and if it's a matter again of whether it's something delivered to a client or actual dollars lost, 
or something that's related to literally human life, then that is a, an emergency. And in which case then there needs to be a clear understanding and expectation of what communication can be immediately put into place in order to contact those who need an immediate response. Otherwise, most of the work that we're doing generally is not an emergency and can wait an hour or maybe even a day to be able to get that response time. So um, you all have come up with some really incredible ideas about those boundaries. So just wanted to also throw in there, you know, you can schedule emails. Um, if you are using the G Suite, um, I'm not sure about Outlook, but if you have the ability to write an email, if you are working at five o'clock in the morning, but you can schedule it to go out later so that you can have the ability to honor the boundaries of perhaps other working hours that people are doing. Um, and then of course, hold the communication limits. Again, just know what they are and then maintain them. Great, at this point right now, I would like everyone to do one final key takeaway in the chat from all of our examples that we've provided and expectations and boundaries. What is the one thing that you are going to be doing differently in your work this week to clarify your expectations or to set a boundary. We're seeing Jackie's sharing, um, stop working at a reasonable time and not just when the kids beg me to stop to be done, but setting that expectation to fulfill for yourself as well. And also sharing with the team the space and the review that you want to get done, Megan says, um, and actually give the team the space to do the work and then return for a review. So again, the remote workspace has such incredible opportunities for us to be fluid and flexible, to have the ability to work on different time zones and in different rhythms throughout the day. Um, you know, it, but it's a, so important then within all of that flexibility that we maintain proactive thought processes and to be intentional about our expectations and our boundaries to be able to help contain everything and make remote work work for us and not us to it. Um, so thank you all so much for being able to join today. Uh, this is part three of our What is Virtual Leadership training series. We will be continuing again next Wednesday, same time, to talk about a pretty big topic, and that is trust. How to trust people you can't see on a regular basis um, and ultimately to maximize those outcomes and as a reminder, the on, learning is ongoing as a remote leader. We have, um, and here are our three top courses that folks have been utilizing, especially during COVID on virtual meetings, how to be making better connections as remote managers in your one-on-one -on -one conversations, and three focus areas for going remote. You all are remote, but if there are folks who feel like you're still struggling in that area, these are resources um, that are easily digestible, all created with that micro learning content. So again, be sure to join us next Next week, if you aren't registered, we'll be sure to send you the link and find us on LinkedIn to stay connected because we are part of your remote leader community and hope to continue on your journey. Thanks so much everyone today.